And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a new I have a newcomer to the temple with something familiar in the temple. Launching on Kickstarter on June on June first at eight AM ES Eastern Standard Time. So calculate on that on your own respective time zones. I do enough of those calculations as it is. Bring the one bring to us coming to us from Old Mages Games. The sword and sorcery adventure known as Atlas Rise or Die, and with me to de to delve into its secrets, the one and only Kristoff. How you doing today, man? Hey, how are you doing, Mildred? It's nice to be here. I'm really happy to be here and talk about all this stuff that we're doing on Kickstarter right now. So, before we before we get into the nitty gritty of things, um, as I as I had mentioned with the previous guy that I've had that I've had on regarding Atlas. I t there's there's a bit of a f a bit of a focus on the humble beginnings in in a sense. So I'd like you to walk me through your introduction to role playing games and what was what's a, what was it about it that made it stick for you? So I'm probably the youngest member of the developers with my 27 years, um, and I actually started to play D and D first. I think it was like 10 years ago. So I was in my teenagers years and. Um, one of my friends, who was actually, I think, t at least 10 years older than I am, he invited me to uh, to join to their session because they had an opening, and that person actually just uh, played Dungeon Master for, for his entire life. He, he loved being a Dungeon Master, and he was so talented and so into it that his uh, session, or the story that he played, it was through five or six years, mm. and... Um, Obviously, at the beginning, as a newcomer, I made so many mistakes. My characters were really, you know, like, uh, problematic. They were all the same. It was hard to come up with a backstory. But overall, eventually, you know, I got to the point when I could develop my own personal play style. And I played Dungeons & Dragons for more than seven years and tried a couple others. Um, Vampire or Masquerade of Empire, what was that called? I think there was this Tsutulu. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, yeah, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and Call of Cthulhu. Don't worry, don't worry about trying to pronounce Cthulhu's Cthulhu properly because the whole point is that it's unpronounceable. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's definitely true. So we tried a couple with my friends and and uh, I always loved, um, you know, sweating together with other people and just rolling dices and shouting on each other and, and under undermining each other's activity, even though we are supposed to help each other. So we we got this uh, we got this uh, vibe every time we played together. And uh, one of my friend who was not involved in D and D that time um, turned out to be one of the developers of Atlas and. Um, just recently, uh, at the beginning of this year, he reached out to me and he was like, hey, look, we are developing Atlas and we definitely need someone who can help us out and join to the, uh, the team. And this is where I actually just ended up helping them out and, and got uh, to know about Atlas. So mm -hmm. I've always played um, role-playing games, mostly uh, Dungeons & Dragons. So Sword & Sorcery is close to my heart. But I, I, I kind of feel that right now there's an overflow of these games. You can't never get enough, and no matter how much um, hard it is during pandemic to to get together um, right now with all these online options with Zoom and Roll Twenty, I think I think uh, all these role playing games are you know on the rise, and mm -hmm. and this is the best time for new players to pick it up and start playing, right? Yeah. Now, it's interesting that it's interesting that you mentioned D and D as your start, and that was ten years ago. So if I if if I may, if I may go out on a limb and and make and make a bit of a shot in the dark, I'm guessing your introduction was third edition. Yes, it was the third edition, and we played that for a long time, and then we just switched to f the fifth edition. Um, I think the last couple of years, but we loved the third edition that time. Mm -hmm. Now, what I f what I do find it what I do find interesting is. There's there's been a, there's been a debate about for the longest time and something I've been critical of is the genre is the genre and the style of fantasy that D, that D&D &D is trying to go for um 
early early on in the in the TSR days, it could be argued that they were trying to go for um, sword and sorcery like approaches, and it somehow molded into straight up um, tol more Tolkien esque high fantasy um, with t with time. Um, given given that that given that being your back given your background being um, third edition, which was very much trying to still be um, um, high fa trying to be high fantasy at that point. Um, what was your first impression seeing the sword and sorcery type of approach for the first time? I think I have to say that I loved uh, the older editions more than the later ones, exactly for the reason why what you mentioned is that that it fe felt more like a sword and sorcery. And then even though it felt like a sword and sorcery, it had an overwhelming amount of rules and complicated character generation, a bunch of magics that was overwhelming to study through it. So I felt a little bit lost. I have to say without my dungeon master at that time, it was really, really hard to pick up the game and then just sit together and play. So it, it was a bit challenging, but still very much less challenging than playing the fifth edition, for example, as a newcomer. Um, now, from your perspective, what's what would you say the appeal is of sword and sorcery as a, as a gaming genre? Uh, first of all, I I love um, the word, the feeling, you know, the sword and sorcery, you know, all these 80s and, and music and, and um, movies that I could just go on and on about that resembles, all of them resembles in our game, in Atlas as well. I can mention a couple, you know, like Dark Crystal, Cruel, mm -hmm. uh, Fire and Dice cartoon, uh, you know, the Conan vibes. And, and I, th I felt like the sword and sorcery, I, I loved the brutality part of it. I loved, you know, how simple... I would not say simple, how less complicated it is, you know, um, and I love the combination of magic and, you know, like the melee weapons uh, compared to other um, role-playing games in the future where, you know, you have more like a, a futuristic vibe set. So I've always loved, you know, you know, the, the magic part combined with, you know, like simple weapons like, yep. you know, swords and stuff like that. And given what you mentioned, that ca that kind of answers another question that I, that was going to ask regarding y regarding your um, exposure to sword and sorcery. If that was something you were exposed to before you even stepped foot when it came to when it came to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, you mentioned you mentioned a you mentioned a bit of overwhelmingness um, when you stepped on to join the Atlas Project. Did you? Did you have that same feeling of over, of overwhelmingness, or was that was that a very temporary affair? Uh, I think I did not at all, and the reason why I did not have did not feel like that is because once I joined the team, the first thing happened is that um, my friend and our other developer forwarded me the rule sets, and he was like, "Just go through it and see how you like it, and if you like it more than if you would." play D D for example and the first thing that came to my mind is is that wow this is just much less complicated and uh, it seems like if i'm in the middle of the fight i don't have to calculate hundreds of things and usually what happens when we sit together and play DD that one fight takes up to three hours mm -hmm. just because we have so many things to calculate if you have a magician or someone who can use magic it's even longer and um, i went through the basic rules and immediately came to my mind that how much better uh, how much uh, more i like this 2d uh, 2 uh, 2d 10 system uh, mm -hmm. than a 20 and how less the calculation a dungeon master has to do in atlas compared to dnd so that was one of the things the other is that the overwhelming magic so i played altogether i think six or seven uh, characters over the six seven years the first you know it died fast Sometimes I ended up, for example, with a magician, I was developing a wizard for more than a week. And on the second session, my wizard died because it teleported itself to the ground and killed himself. And I was so devastated. And I remember it took me two nights just to pick the, the magic, the spells that I wanted to use. And the first two sessions or the first sessions that I played, I realized none of them were important like so many magic you can pick in dnd and nothing was important at all and that was one of the things that immediately came to my mind i realized that if you play atlas as a wizard first you're not going to be overpowered compared to uh, to any other wizards in any other source uh, sword and sorcery game mm -hmm. second 
you will have less choice of magic, but you will have more impact on the team and more useful spells that, you know, picking up a spell that you will never ever use, but it's in the list of spells and it sounds cool, that doesn't worth picking it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it it's interesting that you that you got that you got that experience with the 2D10 approach since there's been plenty of people that I've had on the show who have sworn by 2D10 simply because when you when you factor in pro when you factor in probabilities with it a lot it skews a lot towards the towards the towards um, the middle section right to, right towards the middle so right in right in the range between I'd say 7 and 13 Yes. is the is the highest possibility whereas the outliers um are are much more are much more are much significantly smaller um as opposed to a d20 system where everything is a 5% chance um which some to some that sounds great but the problem is everything is a 5% chance um <laughs> yeah that's true and if you think about that for a second if you are a if you are um, a really skilled barbarian, or let's let's not say barbarian because they usually, you know, let's say a warrior, mm -hmm. you are very well trained with a sword. So if you always have five percent chance for everything, that means you're not you're unlikely to usually roll in the middle. But you're supposed to be able to at least uh, hit the target, right? Because you are skilled with it. So I like the approach that those middle rolls that usually uh, allows you to hit or allows you to, you know, survive a normal, not life-saving uh, um, something, even that, you know, like you will usually be able to, to roll it, mm -hmm. is going to probably hap is going to happen more often. And I like the fact that, all right, I understand that with a D20, you have more uh, higher choice to roll a 20 and the 1, and everything that is around the 20 or a 1 is more exciting, uh, you know, like, Role-playing-wise, you know, you're going to be more excited when you see an awesome combo happen or you fail a saving throw. But to be honest, with the 2D10 system, I like the fact that those are um, less common, more rare, because those moments feel more unique and awesome because you end up rolling only, let's say, 2D20 over the whole night. But that 2D20 or two rolls with D20 uh, on a 20, uh, will be much more exciting than rolling, let's say, four or five ones in two um, individual fights. That's my my approach, I think. There's also the fact that when you when you have the when you have it that a natural twenty is at one percent, you can I'd say you can more easily justify the uh, a a bigger effect because when you think of when you think about it, rolling it rolling a net when you roll a nat twenty in combat in D in D and D, what do you usually get? Um, you'll automatically hit, and do and do max da and do max damage, which you already had a, a certain percent chance of doing anyways. Um, and of course, in, in and of course, there's the whole roll to, roll to confirm to see if you double to see if you on um, double your damage. So in, in other words, in other words, the um that nat, that nat twenty has a bunch of stuff that makes it less impact less impactful than it should be. Um. A net, getting a getting a critical, if you'll if you'll pardon my French for a moment, getting a critical should be should be a case of you fuck them up. <laughs> um, exactly. In, instead of instead of you just you just hurt them slightly more. Yeah, you you're supposed to you know like like hurt them as much. It's it's like like it's how do you. I put into context like you know it feels more like a critical role mm. than not something like oh it's just more damage it's just more damage I roll 20 and it happened again and again and again and the other thing is that sometimes uh, sword and sorcery systems use a, a hundred um, scale when you have to uh, figure out something up to a hundred and you have to do math com subtraction addition mm -hmm. just to figure out if you hit something and I, f I feel like one thing that uh, came to my mind is that if you play Atlas Rise or Die mm -hmm. the 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 battle, the uh, the fights feel more natural, mm -hmm. and sometimes you end up doing it way faster than you were expecting it. Like you know, you might just you know finish a battle in like twenty minutes or ten minutes and go to the next one, and it doesn't exactly, it doesn't feel the same. I understand it. It sometimes it feels like oh, it's just too fast. It's just too fast, but it's not. It depends on your roles, obviously, but it just makes your life and your DM life easier because he was planning for a five-hour session and your entire fight cost him four hours out of the five yeah 
there's been there's been times where I've in so, in some other games I've um I've ended up structuring my sessions almost almost like a t almost like a TV episode. Um and gra granted I do that anyways because it's a good for it's a good format to build a long-term campaign around. But what I mean by that is structuring it so that you have a you have a whole lot of setup, then you have one then you have one um action scene and end session. F um as it, as if the action scene itself is supposed to be the climax in the three act structure of rising action falling um climax falling action which that can that can work at times but if you want but if but if somebody wanted to do a a a traditional dungeon crawl or do a, or do a case where where they want to do this army versus army battle like you'd see in a film it yeah. ends, there ends up being problems when you ha when you have a when you have a lengthy combat system with a lot with a lot of spongy that's definitely true and you know what Mildred? i think i pointed it out a little bit but the other thing is with the magic system mm -hmm. uh, one thing is that everything has a price in in rise of uh, rise or die atlas mm -hmm. so if you cast something that is too powerful you end up losing stamina points if if you if you want to help your team you can definitely do that but just to bring uh, an example stranger things uh, cast a fireball. All right. So, so many f spells are super powerful in Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And if you are playing a, um, let's say a, a ranger, sometimes you feel like you're completely out of the fight, and the mage is all right. I'll take care of it. Let me go there. Let me cast everything, and one round, um, I'll, you know, damage the creature half HP, and and that's what we try to accomplish uh, with the r rules in Atlas Rise or Die that you count, and then your teammates count. And you guys together make it as a team. So a barbarian has as much contribution to a fight as a mage. Mm -hmm. So we try to uh, make the the magicians less powerful. And I think the balance between all these subsystems in in uh, the uh, you know the fights between each classes, I mm -hmm. think that's really important. And sometimes I felt playing D and D over the seven years that uh, my character was less useful in certain situations. It's not because I picked the wrong. Um, spells it's much because other people were much more powerful and there were some uh, players in the session who were hardcore power players mm -hmm. and you know that can definitely kill um, um experience yeah a um i've had i've had to deal with my fair share of munchkinism in in the past um but there um tv tropes has a term has a term for what you're kind of touching on um it's called war linear warriors quadratic wizards um <laughs> the the approach being that um warriors tend to tend, warriors when it comes to their overall power scaling and usefulness tend to advance on a li on a linear scale of x equals level whereas um wizards is more of it's more of um x squ it's more of it's instead of le instead of level plus x it's um le it's um level squ it's level squared for instance and because of that, you have that's why you have wizards being semi semi useful early on, and then later on getting becoming entire um, play, entire parties un, unto themselves. Um, the most infamous example back in third edition, I have to I have to thank some of the mad geniuses o over in the old wizards forums with stuff like Codzilla or um, Pun Pun. <laughs> <laughs> The ex the exploit that allowed it, that allowed somebody to get to get possibly infinite levels and in infinite classes. <laughs> yeah, classical. Um, and Co Godzilla it is just a reflection of how overpowered a prop a um optimized cleric or druid can be, which is where the name comes from, cleric or druid. Um, and it's funny you mentioned ra you mentioned ranger because because. Um, Ranger has had a bad rap over the years of getting out of getting outclassed by the druid, like a lot. Yeah, but it came back recently, I believe, at least. Um, I'm not, not sure about your opinion. The fifth edition, the fifth edition druid, the fifth edition ranger hasn't completely escaped the problem because it's it 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 um aside from the fact that it had possibly the worst capstone of any of the base classes when it came out, that class has gotten revised like three or four times. Over over the last five years, where they keep they keep trying they keep trying to they keep trying to fix they keep trying to fix it, and the big problem is that it's trying to be a, it's trying to be this um 
class that's di that's dipping into se into several toes in a game that is more about having people be extremely specialized. Um, yeah, the bard yeah, has I the same problem. I I felt I felt when I was um, developing my characters over the year in D and D that sometimes it was really challenging to to let's say make a bard or. Or, you know, like, make a druid. A druid is not that much, but, you know, like, for a wizard or for a bard, definitely. Like, it was just, it felt so overwhelming creating the character. And this is something we wanted to avoid in Atlas Rise or Die, to to feel like um, that character creation is just overwhelming. And actually, one of our stretch goals is that if you want to create your character, you can definitely create your character by rolling dices only with your uh, dungeon master. So you don't need to do anything else. Just roll a couple of dices and you will have your character. And I felt like... The original sword and sorcery characters um, is basically like the one that we want to grab, make a twist on it, and then de uh, develop our own set of um, characters that pe people can choose. And and this is one of the, the major pillar of Atlas Rise or Die, is that we didn't invent anything new. The, the 2D10 system has already been invented. We just tried to, to grab um, and use all these old sword and sorcery um, um how do how do you say that all the sorcery like uh, ways or or uh, forms or rule sets that were working perfectly fine mm -hmm. and then put them together and then develop something that is uh, coherent and everything works together all the subsystem works together and then bring brings back this 80s atmosphere that overall i think um i mean not overall sorry uh, over the time uh, years by year dnd &D started to to uh, forget, you know, where it came from and, you know, more characters, more races, everything just, you know, much more complicated by now. And I, I, I feel like with Atlas, I would just definitely give a try if I would be a new player. I would just see how it feels and, you know, if it if it's not your game and you don't like the rules, this is something also which is really neat with Atlas Rise or Die. You can definitely omit the entire 2D10 system and just transfer it into the D&D rule set because it's it's working with any other systems, mostly with D&D. So if you like that, you can definitely use that. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, you can just just stick with the old system. So give, given that, um. Something that something that I've talked something that I've talked about in the past is character cre is character creation design that is rife with traps that create um that create choice paralysis um, choice paralysis being where some where somebody is con is is um concerned that is concerned that a choice that they make now might end up biting them in the ass um a few sessions down the road and would would it be fair to say that that's not as that's not as much of an issue within within Atlas because of the fact that you're skewing for more well-rounded characters? Yes, I would definitely say that. I I would not say if you make a choice at the beginning that would completely uh, destroy the possibility of changing your playstyle or not allowing you to do certain things in the future that you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we could say that. And one of the systems that we developed, for example, I'm not sure if it was mentioned in the previous podcast, is this system called Influence System. Mm -hmm. It's basically, uh, uh, it translates the intri intrinsic, I can't pronounce this word. So it's basically the social interactions between you and the NPC uh, word, uh, which makes, makes, makes you feel... It makes the entire game more coherent and more fluid because when you interact with uh, with all these NPCs, you you gain influence points and then you actually have um, influence on other characters. And I felt like sometimes it also depends on the DM how the NPCs behave. But but some of the NPCs that I played through the the years were really um, really boring, and I felt like developing the system with Atlas and you guys can definitely read it in the in the core book extract to get to know more. I don't want to spoil a couple things with here, but but you just you can just interact more with non players and you can benefit from interacting with non players. And I think that's cool. Alright, I I can I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that. Um now when it can, now when it comes to when it comes to some of some of the um Quests that quests that you have that you have for the Kickstarter campaign. I did want I did want to go into that and what's and what sort of themes you're going with. So first is the Hourglass of um, Hammerax. Um, I'm I'm not going to ask you to spoil anything on it, 
Well, I can spoil it because it's all uh, readable for anyone right now. And once we get live, it will be still readable. So I can spoil it. Um, if you want me to, I can guide you through it. What it is exactly? What I what I I well the reason the reason why I, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want it spoiled is just for is just for um just in just in a manner of of courtesy. But what I am curious about is the is the is the type of the, the type of style of um adventure that that particular is is it whether it's a dungeon crawl a hex crawl or some or something right in the middle of it i would say it's a dungeon crawl so i'm not sure how much you want me to talk about that um basically this is something that for people who would like to to um help us out mm -hmm. get funded mm -hmm. uh, can benefit a lot from um depending it doesn't depend on how much you you help us get funded so if you if you found if you contribute with less than three dollar only two dollar you will be see you will be still able to participate in that uh game mm -hmm. and um i'm not sure uh Mildred, should i say what's the price for for defeating this necromancer called hamorax or um or I'd should we just keep it as a spoiler? I'd rather keep that. I'd rather keep that as a spoiler for this, for the sake of people who who would actually um, jump into that because every game is someone's first. All right, yeah. Then let's keep it as a spoiler. Mm -hmm. You guys should definitely check out the Hourglass of, Hourglass of Homorox, and we have some amazing artwork in our Instagram and Facebook. If you would like to see this this necromancer called Homorax and and what he actually does and we have a little story for it so i would definitely check it out it's yep. um it's really neat mm -hmm. now when it now when it comes to the, when it comes to the when it comes to the um the world the world of of atlas um when i when i looked through when i looked through a lot of the primers and a lot of the information of its setting I I very much got a I very much got a Conan vibe with a lot of the a lot of the areas being loosely inspired by uh, by different by different ancient civilizations or interpretations of ancient civilizations. Would that be fairly accurate for how the world is set up? Yes, definitely. So we have a couple of books and movies that inspired us. Mm -hmm. And for example, if we talk about the uh, the uh, Hamurak story. Um, that one is actually from. Let me think for a second. That was actually from the Sword and Sorcerer. If you ever um, went through that before, the uh, the um, crew uh, movies, or movie, sorry, um, is actually an inspiration for all those space uh, alien races that came to the world of Atlas. The Dark Crystal movie is actually uh, inspired us to. To develop these magical crystals that play a huge role in the world of Atlas as well. The Conan vibes are definitely in the game. If you if you see our uh, intro intro video or half of our pictures, you can definitely say that. Um, it, other than that, Fire and Ice cartoon mm -hmm. and the Robert E. Howard uh, books. We talked about that. So, for example, with the Conan, I would say that the books are much better than the movies. If we can just mention this side note, uh, I don't want to say other people might find it differently but definitely this this um, cuteness we wanted to get rid of some of the uh, sword and sorceries nowadays that you can play that we don't want the game to be cute we want to want the game to be brutal barbaric and i want you to to be afraid that your character might die i want you to to enjoy the brutality of this word uh, this um, if you go through the pictures and and the artwork mm -hmm. you can definitely see that in in the pictures that the vibe is is this survival instinct um, is really in this game, and you know you either rise or die, and uh, and I, I I love that to be honest, and I think our graphic designer made a, a amazing choice with these artwork, and he worked hard to develop it to us. So maybe that's another thing I would like to mention is that that if you play a, um, any um, any sword and sorcery game, one thing that has to be exceptionally good is the graphics because the graphics connects you to the story right to the mm -hmm. background and if you don't have that if you don't have the connection there's no graph there's not enough graphics or there's not enough um novels or short stories about the word you will feel empty no matter how good is the dungeon master you just can't 
develop a story if there are no pictures to to inspire you to to, to uh, light up your imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think I think there's nothing wrong with taking amazing movies and books as inspira inspiration and develop our own world. And then if that helps players to to live through this experience much more deeper than uh, than without these inspirational movies and books, I think that's perfectly uh, fine. Um, now, when it, now taking taking that into taking that into account, um, even though even though you have a third, you have a with the setup that you have, you have a um, third set, you have a third um, edition that you call that you call it, which is the setting. Are there going to be? Do you get? Do you have plans to put in primer material for the setting within the player's handbook? So. Um... So it will be a merged book. Mm -hmm. Will be the the core book, the settings, and the player's handbook together. And uh, definitely, we'll try to make it as um, unique as we can. And one thing is that um, I think it's one of our uh, stretch goals is that if we reach that stretch goal, we will put novels uh, at the beginning of each chapter. Mm -hmm. So fill up the world of Atlas even more over the year. If you followed us on Instagram or Facebook, you could see that every time we posted a picture, we wanted to make sure it's not a picture that we're posting, it's a story we are telling with it. A couple of sentences, sometimes people find it too long on Facebook, but we definitely wanted you to, to have these short stories from everyday life of Atlas. And I think that's one of the the main reasons why I, I initially started to help us, help the team out and um, jump into this project is because I felt, I felt like actually I'm living through the world of Atlas, reading all these short stories. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, not sure if it answers all your questions. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think, I think that, do, I think that does. Um, and give, given that, what would you, what would you be, what would you estimate the total page count to be? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, you know, it it depends because some of the uh, parts of the game we are still writing because it's just a huge amount of, of writing we have to do. Um, I cannot even guess. I would say, no. Let's let's leave it as a let's leave it as a surprise for people. But I would say it would be somewhere between a book that you can you can carry on in your backpack and somewhere between either a Tolkien or or you know um, a book that you cannot carry with you because it's too heavy. So I would say I can't. I can't. Let's let's leave it as a surprise for. For everyone, but if you look at the core book, um, that's just a couple pages long, and you can read through the settings and um, character generation and some basic skills. I would say it 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 also depends on on a couple other factors. We try we've tried so hard to uh, to um, get everything done by now, but we still have a couple of things to to write down and and you know make sure it's working fine. That's one of the major issues with developing an RPG game, right? Is that you want to make sure that the game works well, and there are no subsystems that are not working with each other. Mm -hmm. So I cannot estimate it right now. I, I don't want to estimate something that will end up being an extra 200 page long, because then you will come back to me and you will say, hey, Christoph, you said the book is only 500 pages long and I can't carry it with me, right? <laughs> um, I, can't, I, can't, I, I have carried encyclopedias with me, so you are not going to get that complaint from me. I can guarantee you that. Look, if you get the hard copy version and maybe end up having the uh, the the one that you can get out from the other social game with the well, let's let's not spoiler that either. Mm -hmm. But if you end up getting the hard copy, that might be heavy a little bit. But I was always on the side of this battle where I always wanted to have a hard copy. I could never ever live with the PDF. It doesn't matter how nice is the PDF. I want a you know print out book that I can hold and play with. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes when it comes to some of the, I um, had I had seen that you do, that you're doing a, you're doing a mix of stretch goals and the and the um, social games. Um, what what prompted the idea for doing these social games as a as a way to as a way to as a way to assist when it comes to the kick when it comes to the uh, Kickstarter campaign you guys are doing. I would say that one of the major things that we always wanted to count on are the common are the people who who help us develop the game. You know, the community. We are always really hard on ourselves, making sure that what we are doing is 
good for the community and people enjoy that mm -hmm. so we got a bunch about uh, how much they like the artwork how cool is is this and this and this and we went um on and thought about how can we make it more more interactive for for the followers and viewers and uh, we had this amazing artwork with the the hydra mm -hmm. um and we definitely wanted to do something with that and you know you can you can go out and and try to make a successful Kickstarter campaign, but at the end of the day, what matters are the community, right? The people who play your game, and we want to make sure that they will enjoy what we are doing. So this is just a nice twist, um, if you will, for those who who enjoy getting a, a special edition of the book. If if you if if you're fine with saying that, mm -hmm. uh, with the second social game that we have, and all people has to do is is uh, do a couple of likes, uh, shares, and and follows and you know it's a community challenge so so i was always on that side i love to see a community do something together and then accomplish something together and then the best part of it is that it's it's all free and then you get out something from it that no, no one else will ever get again mm -hmm. something that is unique for those people who who uh, contribute to this second social game with the hydra and trying to chop down these heads so it was it was a twist you know um we don't, we didn't need it for for uh, for the wall, but we figured it sounds amazing. Let's just see how it goes. And so far, we're doing really great with it. So um, I would love to see the rest of the goals um, fulfilled and the prize given to everyone else who everyone who contributed to it. Mm -hmm. Now, like now, when it comes to when it comes to the um, when it comes to some when it comes when it came to some of the pledge levels, which I don't I don't usually. Um, I don't usually I don't usually cover all that often on on the on the podcast, but as I understand, but um, as I understand with e with several of them, there's gonna there's gonna be some add-ons that you're that you're putting on with them. Um, what can you tell me about about some of those? Yeah, definitely, I can talk about that. So there's a couple right now, and we don't have to go into details. Um, maybe I could just mention that we wanted to have an extra cheap one where Asla says. Two dollars, um, UK dollars, um, can you know, like, can contribute to us getting funded. But you can also get all the benefits of the uh, social games, the early bird social game, the first one we talked about. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I, I love that idea that you can get a PDF of those, and no one else will ever get that. Just you, if you contribute to to us to get funded. And um, so, with the add-ons. Uh, we wanted to to develop something that is um, useful for for the players and for the dungeon master. And you know these add-ons are not um, new or unique that no one ever seen before. I guess we can talk about them, right? I can mention mm -hmm. what are these. It would not be a spoiler. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, you know a unique dice set. Like we are not the first one who ever ever developed a unique dice set, but we are the first one who developed an Atlas Rise or Die dice set and. I love those dices, and they look so cool, and they definitely look sword and sorcery. If you look at the number one, um, I'm not even sure that's on the picture, but it's definitely on our social media. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to use Atlas Rise or Die dice set when I'm playing Atlas Rise or Die, and you know they are super cheap. They are in the in the uh, pledges. I never ever seen a Dungeon Master screen before in my life, even though I played D and D so long. I'm not sure about you, but it just looks freaking amazing. <laughs> like yeah. this artwork on this uh, on this uh, uh, dungeon master screen is amazing, and mm -hmm. dice tray is definitely a useful thing. Um, we were always having trouble keeping the dice dices on the table, so I think dice tray is a must-have. Yeah. The bookmarks we have um, that's a quite a good idea, I think, because um, it helps players to uh, to uh, look at the bookmark and just look at the numbers that they have to calculate or use so it's it's uniquely designed for each character and it looks amazing um the posters one of the other thing is that we we were trying to we were trying to give away as many free stuff as we could so people who already subscribed on our newsletter um got all half of these posters already in a wallpaper format or a phone background format and even if you haven't subscribed, uh, even if you have not subscribed to our uh, newsletter yet, if you do it now, you can go get all of them still. Um, and these are just like like these posters uh, would help you definitely to feel um, if you get like two or three in your room. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have a child, I would definitely buy a couple for him. And you know, it, it just feels 
more unique to the game and feels more uh, more Atlas Rise or that than anything else. And I love the posters. They're super cheap and there are so many. So these are just, you know, add-ons that that helps you live through Atlas Rise or Die and they don't cost a lot and, you know, they are in the pledges and um, I personally love them and we might have a couple other in the future but I think for now these are all that we were thinking. Yeah. Now... When it now when it comes to the when it, now when it comes to the set the um the setup, um, I'm not sure if you've I'm not sure if this is something you've can, you've considered, but I've seen I uh, but one one particular avenue that I th that I think is untapped when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to video production that I'd be curious if you guys plan plan on doing. Um, later on, later on in the later on in the campaign is putting is putting a few videos in depth in terms of the core me core mechanics, some of the subsystems, and a full on example of character creation. So I do well, well. A lot of people go into character creation on a on an update for the kick update for the Kickstarter itself. A, m most often they're just text. Have you is that something that you guys have cons have taken under consideration? Yes, definitely. We have a lot of stretch goals, and uh, I don't want to spoil all of them, but there's, for example, one where we can provide uh, players um, a character sheet that they can just download and then use uh, that from our website to uh, to create their own character, to help them create their character. We are thinking of putting uh, more um, tips and uh, suggestions into the book um, in terms of like which spell or which class to use in which situation um we are thinking of of um, uh, putting uh, into each chapter of the core book um, um a cover or summary uh, that talks about all the subsystems um with examples and how to use them so this is definitely something we we wanted to implement in atlas rise or die and i think we are doing a, a really great job with that and uh, for example one of the stretch goals <laughs> which i think is quite uh, funny is that we we are thinking of having a name generator uh, where people can just go online and then generate their character name Atlas Rise or that character name and I think that's quite um, funny to be honest like I, I remember I had a couple uh, friends who played the exact same character name for over and over again and uh, we definitely want to help new players one of the uh, stretch goals that I think are already, which is already available on our uh, Kickstarter preview page is that um, a subsystem. Uh, we added this special subsystem to the core book that aids players th the ability to create magical items called talismans fast faster and much more easier than not using this subsystem. And um, and I, I think any way we can help players to uh, to make their character uh, faster, and more um, um, effective. That. Uh, those um, ways will be implemented in in the core book, and and I think we are doing a great job with that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it com now, when it comes when it comes to the se the um, the set the setup, you guys are, you guys are gonna set you guys are gonna launch on June first and go and go for about twenty and go for about twenty seven days. Um, in the in the int in the interim with in the interim with that, um, I'm go I'm get I'm guessing that I'm guessing that you, I'm guessing that um, you're gonna be you're gonna be looking closely at the, at any at any sort of feedback you guys get when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the impre when it comes to the impressions and, with it within that within that, um. Some one thing that I'm one thing that I'm curious ab I'm curious about because I've um because obviously I've had I've had this particular subject matter on um tw on twice before, but when it but how but has the, have you guys done a extensive amount of play testing even before the, even before this full on launch? Yes, yeah, so we did we did uh, uh play testing a lot. It was actually prior to I joined to to uh, this project so it was in mm -hmm. 2020 um but we did a lot we still have a little bit to go but um you know we made the this core book extract available to to anyone um long ago and we got a lot of feedback uh from that and mm -hmm. I, I think we are on the on the right track um you know most of the the 
most of the parts of the game that are the basics and all those rules that has to work coherently and must work before we launch this um, project on Kickstarter are done and they're working beautifully. You know, little nuances and little changes might still happen, but we would not uh, go back to the core book and modify something huge. So I think we are feeling pretty good with that. Um, it's it's just the extensive artwork and mm -hmm. background and um, lore that we have to still um, work on to to make it neat. But I think we are we are pretty confident with the the, the core um, elements of the game mm -hmm. by now. Now, with the with all that's with all that said, I um I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how the project develops when it when it goes live. Um. And I do wit I do wish you the I do wish you the best of the best of luck and to, but to make sure that I don't jinx it. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I actually. So did uh, did the last podcast you guys just covered um, about um, the other other era uh, time uh, of Atlas that we would like to. Uh, to develop because I don't know if we mentioned it, but Atlas Rise or Die is just the first, um, first, um, how do you say, module or first issue, first chapter. So Atlas is the word, right? And mm -hmm. we would like to develop four standalone um, uh, stages of Atlas. So we are talking about Atlas Rise or Die, this this uh, brutal barbaric word. But in the future, you know, if it's successful and we see, uh, we definitely plan for long term. We would like to to follow Atlas Rise or Die with a, a club punk pirate and then a steampunk western themed issue, and then after that we would like to definitely have a post apocalyptic dark fantasy. So, so here we are trying to establish the foundation of of uh, a new um, world that we're building, Atlas. And Atlas Rise or Die is the first milestone we have to reach, and and here it is, less than a, you know, like less than a week. Um, we'll be having you know like the release date, the live, and we'll see how people like it. Um, we are pretty um, we're feeling good, but I can I cannot lie. I have to say I'm going to sit in front of the Kickstarter and keep pushing the refreshing button mm -hmm. every every ten minutes to <laughs> see how we're doing in the first day because that's the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. And with and I'll, I'll certainly be I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops because I always love seeing the journey that that pe that people ha that people have. Um, with the with that with that in with that in mind, um, I would l I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to dive deeper into Atlas or to uh, or to or to exclaim how the dice gods are merciless. Because they are, <laughs> um, the door is always open. Oh, as, thank you so much. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Uh, well, I was I was drinking the whole time, so should <laughs> I, should I just stop? I guess or no, <laughs> absolutely not. All right. Well, I keep continuing. Then thank you so much for allowing me to be here, and and this is a wonderful experience, and I'm hoping that. We can come back again in the future and mm -hmm. discuss our success, but I'm not going to jinx it. So I'm just going to keep drinking. Mm -hmm. Cheers. And of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Definitely. <laughs> and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!